Um, we are going to start, like I said the other time, uh, we are just looking at um, uh, pathograph basics. So I'm going to share some slides. I think it will be short. It's just to, to get everyone on the same page. Yeah. Can everyone see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is the correct one. Yeah, just um, staying on this um, slide that you need to be just aware of the um, of the terminology again. When you look at the pathograph, there are all these words that, that are there. So I hope we all know what parity is. That's uh, gravidity, modding, descent, all these terms that are there on your pathograph. I hope everyone knows what this is and I'll make that assumption. This is just um, a reminder that we all know what we are talking about. No one is in the wrong class. Okay, so this is a pathograph. Um, we know that uh, the pathograph is really a graphical representation of labor. It's something that we use um, in every labor ward in this country. Uh, no matter how rural you go, you find this uh, gadget on our wards. Um, over the last few years, it has faced a lot of attacks, uh, this, this gadget. Um, the first attack that it has faced has been that um, maybe the active phase should not start at four centimeters um, because four centimeters is too early and most patients will end up with a caesarean section if we start the pathograph at four centimeters. So many people have been advocating and I hear some facilities have agreed that maybe they start the pathograph at five centimeters. Um, the goodness in that is that the, um, you start plotting the pathograph much later and therefore yeah, you have less interventions. Um, the problem with that is that most of our patients on our wards all over the country have um, labors that are delayed. That's why we still have a lot of stillbirths. That's why we have uh, ruptured uterus. Uh, that's why we have a lot of um, fistula because labor is already delayed from where the patient is coming from. So it means that if we start the pathograph at five, we are really adding to that delay in our setup. So maybe we are better off starting earlier because then the patients will reach the hospitals earlier and so on and so forth. But that's, um, that's a side story, but something that you have to be aware about. Then, um, there's another, um, another labor monitoring tool that I think the World Health Organization is trying to come up with. I, I can send you the links later, but it's trying to add more things to the pathograph so that um, more things are documented. The other non-medical things that we do for the patients are documented. Do they have a partner on the side? Do they have some company as you are taking care of them? What kind of analgesia have they received at what dose? All those things. But you know that all those things could be added on the pathograph uh, if, if we want. Uh, I think most obstetricians feel that our pathograph is okay. The one we are using right now. Uh, the problems we have 
with fetal and maternal outcomes and not because of the two. So that is why despite the coming two, which is a new two, I wish I showed you a slide, um, has been just put aside at the moment because our problems are that we don't have enough midwives, we don't have enough doctors, uh, patients move so many um, kilometers from where they are to come to the hospital. That's why they have morbidity. It's not the two that has a problem. So we've left these two as it is. So having said that, um, this is the pathograph, the picture that you have. So you have all those demographics that you have to put there, the name of the patients, the gravidity, which we all know, the parity, the file number, the date that you admitted the patient, the time of admission, and there's also the time that the membrane is ruptured and the duration um, of that. Then the next part is what is called um, the fetal monitoring part. So the fetal monitoring part has a fetal heart. You can see the numbers there are from like 80 to 200. Then uh, when you're looking at the amniotic fluid, you're also monitoring the fetus. So on the amniotic fluid part, the amniotic fluid can be uh, meconium stained. It can be blood stained. Sometimes uh, meconium can, uh, the amniotic fluid can also be absent. So those are the letters you have to put in those boxes uh, on top there on the amniotic fluid. So the membranes can be intact, so you don't see any liqua. So if the membranes are intact, you put I, just on that line where you have, um, where you have amniotic fluid in those boxes. Then uh, you can have clear liqua, you put C if you have clear like amniotic fluid is clear, it's like water. Then if it's blood stained, you put B. If it's meconium stained, which is a sign of fetal distress, you put M. If it's blood stained, it's uh, like a sign of abrupt shop placenta. And if it's absent, sometimes if somebody has been in obstructed labor, uh, the liqua can be absent because the liqua has leaked through the whole duration of the prolonged labor. So there's no like one. Then you have modding there. Modding is really normal, but when it's excessive, it's a sign that the head is too big. So it's having a problems getting into the maternal pelvis. So it can be a sign of fetal distress, or is it um, a sign of um, CPD? Then you have the cervical graph. Uh, the cervical graph is this area where I've plotted an X. It's the place where we plot the um, progress of labor. So I'll, I'll just um, go straight to that. So you've seen where I have plotted the X. So when a patient comes into labor ward and they are four centimeters, that is where you plot. You don't plot anywhere else. You plot just where I plot. So the first plot on the pathograph starts on the alert line. Any plot that you're going to do on the pathograph, the first one starts on the alert line. Let's say the patient comes at six centimeters. Again, your first plot, just go up the, the Y axis and look for six, then draw a line across in the x-axis and plot uh, where the, the cross is. So that's where you plot if somebody comes in at six centimeters. And it's the same, if they come at seven, if they come at eight, it's the same. So I'm just demonstrating this because this is the most annoying mistake uh, that I see when we have exams, that I see people plot anywhere they like. But the point here is that when you plot your first plot, it should be on that line. So this patient you see on the screen uh, came in into labor ward at nine centimeters. So I go up to nine on the y-axis and go across and plot um, that x at nine. So this is how you plot. So this is a patient who comes in at six centimeters. This is a patient who comes in at four centimeters. This is a patient that comes in at nine centimeters. So that's, that's how you plot. So don't plot anywhere else. Your first plot on the pathograph, plot it 
on the alert line. That's where that plot goes. Then once, once you have, once you do that first plot, you've seen I've drawn this red line down the pathograph. Everything else that you are going to plot will be either on this line or in front of the line. You don't put anything behind this line. So I've given an example. There's a yellow dot there. That's where I'll put the time. Let's say this patient came in at, um, we are starting the tutorial at 17 hours. So this patient came in at 17 hours. Where I've put that star there is where I write 17 hours. Then the next box in that line, in the timeline, will have 18 hours, 19 hours, 20 hours, 21 hours, 22, 23, 24, zero, 01. So the last box in this line will have, will end up with 21 hours because where I have put that circle there, a circle with a cross. That's where I'll put the time that this patient came to labor ward, which is 17 hours. So is that is that clear? Yes, so. Yeah. Yes, it's clear, doctor. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just go back because I see you people plot where, wherever you want that first plot. And when I see that bad plot, really I get irritated and I just stop looking. And I just give a zero or a one out of 10 on that OSCE station because I know that this person was not on labor ward and they didn't understand the simplest two. And their logbook, they have a logbook where they are plotting 10 paragraphs. So if they didn't even know how to plot, then this person was not on labor ward and they don't they don't deserve to pass that exam. So I don't read anything else if I see this first plot and the first plot is wrong. So if the patient comes in at four, you plot there. If they come in at six, you plot there. If they come in at nine centimeters, just the point is that you plot everything on the, on the alert line. Your first plot comes on the alert line. Then anything that comes after, you can plot uh, anywhere else. Then I drew this um, red line to just indicate that where after I've made this first plot, which is dilatation, everything else I'm going to write that this patient, the parameters of this patient on admission, all the parameters will be in front of that line. I, I will not plot anything behind that line. That's the point. So I've put a circle there and I've put it on the place which says time. So our patient here came in labor ward at 17 hours. So I'll write that 17 hours on that place where I've put that circle and the plot. So that is the point I'm trying to make here. So we move on to the next slide. So you see that we start from the top. So we look at the fetal parameters. So You've seen where I've plotted the, um, the fetal heart. The fetal heart for this baby is uh, somewhere between 130 and 140. So I've just plotted uh, 140, and that 140 is on that red line. I'm not saying that you will draw this red line on your pathograph. I'm just trying to demonstrate so that um, none of us here makes this mistake, since we are all here. So you put that dot, usually it's a dot, a black dot on the um, on that 140, but that it should be on that same line. Then we've already put our map there. Our map is the is the dilatation, which is that cross that is on the alert line. So this patient was admitted at seven centimeters. They were admitted at 17 hours. We've already talked about that, and 17 hours is represented by that uh, that star that I've put uh, in that uh, place where there's time. And then this patient, uh, when they got admitted, their descent was about three. So I've put a circle just below the cross on the alert line to demonstrate descent. Um, we can see from there. And then when we go down, 
we move to the contractions. This patient on admission was seven centimeters. They were having strong contractions and these contractions were about four in 10 minutes. So I have this plot on the contractions. We know that if you do this dark shading, these contractions are strong. So contractions that are strong means contractions that are anywhere between 40 and 60 seconds. So if you have contractions that are beyond 60 seconds, it means that you have um, hyperstimulation of the uterus, meaning that the contractions are stronger than, than usual. And we know hyperstimulation of the uterus can cause uh, fetal distress because uh, blood supply to the fetus go through, goes through the myometrium. So if the myometrium is contracting excessively, there's little blood supply and oxygen to the fetus and the fetus ends up with fetal distress. The other thing hyperstimulation of the uterus can cause is, um, is ruptured uterus, of course. So, okay, the point again here is that I have plotted the contractions, which are four in 10 minutes, I've plotted them just in front of the line. You see that I'm not plotting anything behind that line. Everything is either in front of the line or on the line. So you can see the things that are on the line and you can see the things that are in front of the line. So that is about contractions. You can see where I have plotted it. Then when you move to oxytocin, let's say this patient was uh, receiving oxytocin then it should be in front of the line. So if we had put five international units in one liter, we put a five just in front of the red line. And then at the bottom, you put how many drops per minute of oxytocin are you giving this patient? So if you are giving them five, 10 drops per minute, you just put 10 drops per minute again in front of that, of that line. Then when you move down, again on the same line, you see that we have drugs given to the patient. So let's say this patient is receiving pethidine uh, for analgesia in labor, or they are receiving fentanyl. Those are the two common drugs we use for analgesia in labor. So that will be again in front of the red line. The box in front of the red line is where you're going to put uh, those drugs. Then um, we move down to the blood pressure. You can see again that the blood pressure of the mother, which is about 160 over 90 or over 70, is again on that line. And then there's the pulse of the mother. We can see that her pulse is about 120. I've plotted it right on top of the, of the line for the blood pressure. And they are all falling on this red line. Then you move on to temperature. Temperature should be in front of that red line. Uh, the urinalysis findings, the amount of protein, the amount of acetone and the volume of the urine should all be in front of that line. And then you follow the same rules when you do the next plot on the next exam, because we know the next exam for this particular patient that we have in front of us, since she's seven centimeters, her next exam is going to be in three hours. Because in three hours, we expect this patient to be, uh, to be fully dilated, so at 10 centimeters. So we we'll assess at 10 centimeters. So it's not every patient that you assess every four hours. So this particular patient will be assessed at, since they came at 17 hours, so it's 18, 19, 20 hours. So that's when uh, the next exam for this patient will be to be at 20 hours. So you go back to the time that box has, that we have indicated on time is 17 hours. So 18 hours, 19 hours, 20 hours, you plot the next, uh, the next plot. So this this is how you this is how you plot uh, the findings on the pathograph. And like I've said, on your next plot, you have to follow uh, similar rules. Only that now you just go 
if you say the next on the next exam she's nine centimeters, just go to nine and the time. So where the time she has come and the dilatation, the new dilatation you've found meet, that's where you plot uh, your dilatation. Yeah, so I hope that is clear, especially on this, the plotting of the first plot. That's what the plotting of the findings on admission, that's what I wanted to have cleared because this is where uh, lots of people do the wrong thing and then it means that everything else is wrong. Yeah, so can, can, uh, can I have some question or some clarification? Uh, Doc? Yes. Uh, I think a clarification. Yeah, go on. The time we were in fifth year, we were told that uh, when you are plotting on the pathograph, there are things that you need to be checking hourly and things that you need to be checking every 30 minutes. Like, for instance, when you're talking about, uh, <clears throat> I think that was construction, you need to be checking them every after one hour to determine if the construction is still strong and weak, something like that. Yeah. So what clarification do you need? No, uh, since you said if, uh, for instance, someone comes at 17, it means your next checkup should be after four hours. So I wanted to know if maybe we should stick to next checkup being after four hours while you check everything, or maybe it's uh, every hour. Okay, so um, that is really your assignment and I have it at the end of the slides. I'll, this one. Yeah, so it's good you have preempted it. But let's go back to your question and just clarify a few things that you are really uh, plotting on the pathograph the things that you are finding as the labor is progressing. So like you have rightly put it, fit or heart, we record every 30 minutes. So every time that you plot the next thing, you know, like on the fit or heart boxes, every, every small box there is 30 minutes. So you plot the fetal heart, you check on the fetal heart for the baby every 30 minutes. So you plot. But the, why I'm stressing the first plotting is that if you plot this first admission finding wrongly, then everything else that you plot on the right side will be wrong. Because I know you guys are clever. So once you plot this first plot correctly, everything else will be easy because you just follow the time. So the next 30 minutes you plot a fetal heart, you just plot it next to this same fetal heart. But 30 minutes later, knowing that every box is every 30 minutes. Maternal pulse, for instance, that is also done every 30 minutes. Um, yeah, things like that. Urinalysis is done four hourly. So they are, that's your homework. So all these parameters that we are recording on the pathograph, they are not all being recorded after four hours. It's, it's, the, it's the vaginal exam that is being done every four hours because if you do vaginal exams uh, too frequently, you end up with infection. Uh, and also it's very um, uncomfortable for the mother for you to be doing vaginal exams every hour. So you are going to check in your homework how often you do the fetal heart, how often you do descent, how often you do dilatation, which we've talked about, how often you are checking on contractions, how often you are checking maternal BP, how many, how often you are checking um, maternal pulse, and how often you are doing urinalysis. So that, that you are going to check, and it's one of the questions that I asked the Levy students in the, in the supplementary exam that they just wrote. How often do you do these parameters? So that's why I put it there as, um, as something that you can look up because the purpose of this tutorial was not really to go into the pathograph, but uh, to go into the everything about the pathograph, but to get you to, to plot it correctly because once you plot it correctly, then it's easier to interpret 
and it's easier to follow what's, what's going on. So you can build on this. Once your plotting is correct, then the nurses are not laughing at you that the doctor doesn't know how to plot. And that's what we are seeing on labor ward. Nurses laughing at interns because they have plotted the pathograph the, the wrong way. They've, they seem not to know what they are doing. So we need to get the first things right, which is plotting the pathograph correctly before we move on to interpretation and, and the other things. So that's that. Are there any other clarifications? For me, I think that was okay. I don't know about other people. Yeah, other people. It's clear. It's clear. Um, just uh, a bit on uh, cervical dilation. I think I missed something. You said on the first line, uh, when, when booking, uh, dilatation should be put on the alert line at the time they come. Then uh, let's say three hours later, should we also continue putting on the alert line or? No, you, you, just, you just put where put it where belongs. The, where the time meets with the dilation? With the dilatation, that's where you put. The way you plot uh, in grade 12, when you're doing mm -hmm. uh, the y-axis and the x-axis, you, okay. get, you get your value on the x-axis, which is the time in this case and you get your value on the y-axis, which is the dilatation. Then where those two meet is where you plot. Okay. That is clear? Very clear. Yeah, then again, I'm very particular with terminology. I didn't say that, that on booking, no one said that you plot on booking because booking is your first continental visit. Yes, yes, yes. That is what is called booking. When the patient is not is coming to labor, that's not booking. Yeah, so you need to be careful in obstetrics. When you say booking, it means one thing. It means your first continental visit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we only have 10 minutes. So I'll just uh, go through the other things that I've put there. So the other things, I think this is important, fifth years and seventh years, maybe seventh years more importantly, because you are not going to be forgiven for missing this. So when you have a pathograph and it's been plotted, you need to see what kind of abnormalities do you have on a pathograph? So you have what are called protraction disorders and arrest disorders. So protraction means that the labor is moving, but it's moving slowly. Um, arrest means that the labor is stuck. It's not moving at all. So arrest can be arrest of dilatation, or it can be arrest of descent, or it can be both. Even arrest can be arrest of, even protraction can be a protracted dilatation and a protracted descent, meaning that the baby is descending or the dilatation is moving forward, but it's moving at a rate that is slower than what you expect. So I have these pathographs here. We can see that um, we have this patient here. When you look at the dilatation, and descent. This patient was admitted at 10 hours. Then we see that at 14 hours on the next exam, they were, their descent was still five. So that is kind of like an arrest of descent, uh, so to say. But when you look at dilatation, they came at four centimeters, but on the next exam at 14 hours, they were five centimeters. So there has been some progress but the progress has been slow. So you can see what, what was done. Oxytocin was started. They put 10 international units in one liter and started at 15 drops per minute. And the contractions changed from being moderate, from mild to moderate to strong until this patient delivered at 20 hours to a 2.6 kg uh, baby. So. This is one abnormality. So we can see that this, there was some arrest of dilatation, some arrest of descent, and maybe a slow or protracted dilatation. And this patient, uh, the reason was that they had uh, the contractions were not good. So they were augmented 
and they ended up delivering. Their fetal heart was okay throughout, and the maternal vitals, BP, pulse, were also okay throughout. We can see the temperature was okay for these patients. We can also see that the membranes were intact, and around 14 hours, they did artificial rupture of membranes. It's written there, ARM, glycol was clear, and then oxytocin was started, and the patient delivered. So this is how you summarize um, what is on the pathograph. Then we move on to the next pathograph. We have this patient. Their, their labor also progressed well. They came in at four centimeters. Their descent was three. Yeah. Their descent was three. Can people hear me? We can now hear you. Sorry, I was interrupted by a call. Yeah, so yes, we can hear. You. Yeah, so the the dilatation they came with was four. They progressed to about six and got stuck at six. We can see that the line goes flat at six. Then descent really did it move throughout the labor. There was an arrest of descent. This was uh, in terms of dilatation. There was protraction. So it means it was moving, moving. Or maybe we can say there was um, a protracted uh, dilatation and then there was a secondary arrest of dilatation. So it moved and then it got stuck. But in terms of uh, descent, we can see that throughout the, um, the labor, this descent didn't change. So this patient ended up with a cesarean section, delivered a 4.4 kg baby, and you can see that there was some kind of fetal distress as well here. Maybe that was the indication for a cesarean section. The fetal heart has gone down. There's meconium in the Lyqua. Uh, there's modding grade three, but the contractions were strong. The vitals of the mother were, were okay. So that is about um, this. So you need to remember that the two disorders you have on the pathograph are protractions, and arrests. And you can have arrest of dilatation or you can have an arrest of descent. You can have a protracted descent or you can have a protracted um, dilatation and all those combinations are possible. But you need to know how to summarize findings on the pathograph and I've tried to do it for you uh, as, we, as we were speaking. So those are the vital findings on this, on this pathograph. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone has some questions. So yeah, this is Mrs. H. She's, she's of course now a para, she was a gravida four, para three. So she's now maybe a para, para four. She delivered at 1730 hours via cesarean section secondary to fetal distress um, and uh, CPD, because we can see modding there and so on. Yeah, via CPD, uh, delivered a 4 kg baby. Abga score is not indicated there, but she delivered at 17.30 and so on. So this, this is um, what is there. I don't know in the next two, three minutes if, if someone has a question. I think it was clear, Doc. It was? OK, that's good. So I don't expect anyone to fail this station. Everyone, uh, whether you are Unilas, you are Levy, uh, this station is there. And maybe sometimes we have two stations on pathograph. One, to interpret, which I've tried to do, interpret what's going on with the pathograph. Um, the second one, um, maybe summarizing what you can see on the pathograph about this patient. Then number, the third thing is about plotting. 
yeah. So you have a patient who comes in at four centimeters, then they progress to seven centimeters, then you plot the findings. So I've tried to cover all those um, exam aspects and also uh, the, um, yeah, just apart from exams, the word aspect, because people are laughing at us. Yeah, that we have doctors who don't know anything. So let's, um, let's read further and just practice. You go and um, do your logbook, do your pathograph things, and yeah, build build on the on the basics that that we have here. So I hope everyone has understood the the basics on the on the plotting. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Shanzi. Yes. Can you please share the recording? Yeah, I hope I can share. I'll I'll find a way. I don't even know uh, how to share a recording, you. but then anyway, I'm recording. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try All right, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, the meeting is finished. We just have 30 seconds. So I'll, I'll inform you what next one we can have. Um, I have that, um, that, what do you call it? That other presentation um, on, on, um, on the MVA instrument, which we always ask on that YouTube link I gave you so you can have a look at it as well. Okay, thank you. Maybe tomorrow we'll look at it. Thank you, thing. Dr. Shanzi. Okay, okay, bye. Thank you, Dolph.